Okay, so I'm back with another The Gift of Fortune read-through. Um, if you didn't already know, I read the prologue on our YouTube channel. But today I'm going to read the first chapter of our suspense thriller novel trilogy called The Gift of Fortune. So the first chapter is called The Webs of Despair. Is this what I was made for? Am I truly a god? Just two of the many questions I'd ask myself every time I'd go to write. Not your ordinary self-reflection, I know, but my life was always everything but. I was no ordinary writer. I was different. I had a gift. The things that I wrote were alive. Physical creations spawned from my imagination. It took me quite some time to admit this was true. It took even longer to understand just how to use this gift of mine. In fact, I still didn't fully figure all of that out. It wasn't like I had a manual to work with. No. Everything had to be learned from experience, alone. Success and failure. But to be completely honest, I never thought of my ability as a gift. It just never felt that way to me. Gifts are supposed to make you happy, right? Well, this particular one has brought me nothing but pain, but I still loved to write. Through the hardships and tough times, my stories had always been my easiest outlet of expression. It's always been my passion since a very young age. Writing was all I'd known. No other time in my life had been more difficult than the past six months. I was in the middle of my first major book title. Although my desire to tell stories was at its highest, there was something missing. Inspiration. As an amateur author, I could write chapters upon chapters, never slowing in pace. There was no pressure back then. Then, everything became much more complicated. I had to compete for the attention of multitudes of audiences, all wanting the greatest story they had ever read. I had an opportunity to do something incredible, and thanks to a few seemingly good people, I had the platform to do it on. I was used to simply writing from home, but my boss would insist that I should work in the office. It was a tall, corporate-looking building smack in the middle of the city. The building looked to be made of thousands upon thousands of windows. The windows weren't transparent, but reflective. When the sun hit it just right, it looked like a giant lantern. I felt proud to know that I worked at such a place. I still remember the first day I walked up the concrete steps and toward the doors. I saw my reflection in the glass doors. I was wearing my favorite suit. I stared into my own brown eyes. My gaze moved to my lean and shaved face. My expression unwearied, not showing signs of stress. My skin wasn't as pale then. It was a light, tawny pigment, just like my mother's was. My nose was much more straight and regal, more like my father's. The long black hair that normally flooded my scalp was slicked back and tied into a single ponytail. I liked the way I looked. I was ready for my first day, so I thought. I loved to write at home but was new to the whole professional thing, so I didn't mind doing whatever I was told. This turned out to be just one of my many mistakes. I used to go into work every day wanting to write something amazing. Back then, I struggled to make that happen. Fortune! It's been well over a month! When are you gonna have the next chapter done? Jervis cried out. The pounding of Jervis's gargled voice echoed through my head a lot. Just about every day, to be exact. How long does it take to write a damn chapter? He continued. I was never fond of that voice of his, nor Jervis, nor any of his psychopathic friends he called his editors. I'm almost there. Just a few more pages and it will be done. I said, giving him a sarcastic smile. Good. The last thing we need is to be late on another damn deadline. I always had my reserves about the guy, and I was completely right to have those thoughts. Jervis was easily pushing into the latter half of his life. I never quite knew his exact age, but I assumed he was about 60 or so. 
It was more than bald, you know, the top center of his head. Strands of dark hair remained neatly cut just above his ears. He wasn't a tall guy, but he was large, at least compared to me. Jervis Shirley weighed close to 300 pounds, while I could barely maintain a healthy looking 180. He was also a money-hungry, self-righteous, arrogant, and my boss. I had only been a professional author for almost three years lived my dream, shared my stories with the world. Everything I worked so hard for was just on the horizon. I was going to speed towards it, even if I did so recklessly. As an amateur, I was often credited for having very vivid, imaginative storylines and relatable characters. I still remember that critic. That's where my characters were living amongst the people. I couldn't help but to chuckle at that one. If he had only known just how right he was. Initially, I didn't receive any attention from critics nor publishers. I wrote a lot of stories, but they never picked up any traction. It wasn't until my wife, Laura, suggested that I start to post them online rather than seek a publisher. I followed her advice and sure enough, it worked. I was able to gain a following of readers who actually cared about my writing. Laura my wife, the woman I pledged my life to. Words can't describe her beauty and how much I loved her. I would have done anything for her. She changed my life. After my stories spread online, I finally hooked the eyes of a few publishers. It was a bit strange going from completely ignored to nearly having publishers eating out of the palms of my hands. They were begging for my stories, offering money, perks, and the fame that came along with having a bestseller. Boy, were those times fun. Short-lived, but fun indeed. Once the courting settled and I chose the company I wanted to produce books with, I underwent a change. I went from a fresh new author to a guy who couldn't even produce a single chapter of valuable work. I became a dud. I used to think Jervis only put up with me because I was under a strict contract from the publishing company. I didn't really blame him for his attitude toward me, I hadn't written an interesting story since I signed that contract. My workstation was like a second home, a slightly worn office desk filled with loose sheets of paper and balled up stories that even I couldn't bear to read. I used to type all of my work into a computer, but I reverted back to the simple pen and pad routine. I hoped to recapture some of the old inspiration from my amateur days. To my left and right, were two identical panels that separated my workstation from the next. No one worked next to me, or even that close at all. I wasn't sure what anyone else was working on either. Probably graphic design, editing, and all the other jobs that it took to run a publishing company. In front of me was a single window. I spent hours staring out that window. Not daydreaming, just religiously staring. Not brainstorming, not even thinking just staring. Like I said, I usually didn't leave work with much done. Honestly, Michael, whatever this is that you're going through, you have to get over it. That's what Jervis would say to try to get through to me. I wasn't sure if he was actually concerned for me or his money. I was too frustrated with myself to care. That writer he saw in me was gone and I was his ghost. One afternoon, toward the end of my workday, Jervis and I had a conversation that changed my entire life. It all started with a question. A question I had been debating the answer to. Jervis? I called out. He seemed enthusiastic. It was rare that I even talked much back then, so he appeared to perk up when I had something to say. Can gods be mortal? Walking among the ones he's given life? I asked. With an unsure look on his face, he responded, Um, is this one of those artsy type questions? Jervis often will call my questions artsy. This was his excuse for not wanting to answer them. As if he couldn't imagine ever relating to someone like me. Then again, I used to think he and I were nothing alike. But time in the void showed me different. No, I just wanted an answer, I responded. Jervis put his hand on my shoulder. Michael, many of us are gods living among mortal. The real question is about power. Who truly has it? 
I never expected him to refine my question like that. I thought he'd simply give a shoddy answer just to get me to shut up. That's what he'd normally do, but he continued on from there. Look, Fortune, this is all going nowhere. It's been a while since we've gotten anything from you, and things haven't gotten any better. The editors and I have been thinking, and we have some new ideas to help you out. No thanks, I said unemotionally. Jervis chuckled. <laughs> Funny. Well, how about this? You do the story the way we tell you to, or we'll have no choice but to shelve you. Shelf me? I had heard of writers being placed aside or shelved for a while. Never thought Jervis would actually say that to me, though. I felt low. Writers who were shelved typically received very little pay. I could barely pay my bills with the money I was making then. Not to mention Laura. How could I have been there for her? There was no way I was going to allow that to happen. I can't just drastically change up the story, Jervis. People aren't going to read an inconsistent story, I argued and pleaded. In case you haven't noticed, you haven't written any stories, Fortune. Your amateur stuff only gets you so far with me. The contract you signed was very simple. We pay you to write. Jervis leaned on one of the walls that separated my desk from the others. There have been whispers around the office. They say you've become boring. No one's interested in your characters, and no one's interested in you, Jervis confessed. I hung my head, and I began to fill with rage. You said you wouldn't do this to me, Jervis. I understand your situation. You have nothing to worry about. Isn't that what you told me? Isn't that why I agreed to work for you? Yes, and I still mean those things. That is, if you do exactly as I say, he said. And what exactly is that? I quickly reacted. He laid down a rather thick manuscript in front of me, with the words, Hostile Love, written on its cover page. I flipped through the pages, my eyes catching nearly every other word. It was a nightmare. There was absolutely no way I could go along with it. So I refused once more. He went completely silent. Although this only lasted a few seconds, it felt like hours. What was he thinking? What was he going to say? In all my pondering, I could not have predicted his next words. How long has it been now? Two years? That's all it took. I instantly knew where he was going, and I didn't stop him. Instead, I allowed myself to be ensnared, tangled in the webs of despair. You told me that her condition has gotten worse, am I right? What are you going to do when you don't have the money to afford her medicine anymore? He was relentless. I felt myself shaking. I guess I shouldn't have been surprised. In the back of my mind, I always felt that the day would come when Laura would be dragged into this somehow. Laura was born with a rare disease that had plagued her since she was a child. She wasn't the only person with this disease, but unlike many of the others, her blood allowed it to fester. Much of her life, she often had to be monitored in hospitals whenever it seemed to flare up. Her symptoms came and went, and with so little research of the disease, doctors weren't able to pinpoint exactly how to treat her, let alone cure her. Laura's illness didn't deter me. My love for her never faltered. We found ways to manage our lives around her disease. Things weren't as bad as the doctors claimed at first. Tragically, after our first year of marriage, not only did the flare-ups happen more frequently, they worsened. Naturally, I felt compelled to do whatever I could to help. Most of the income from my books went toward Laura's medicine and care. Even with the money I was getting then, although much better than what I was making before, it was evident we weren't going to be able to afford her medicine for much longer. I sat there clenching my fist, gripping tighter and tighter with every word that spewed from his vile mouth. Subtle tears fell onto my merely blank pages in front of me. Sitting there and listening to that jerk wasn't what brought on the emotions. Knowing he was completely right and that I had no other way of helping Laura was the true culprit. What gives me the right to change the lives of these characters, Jervis? You're a writer, Fortune. This is what you do. You create fictional characters and you manipulate their fictional world. 
So many of you get wrapped up in your own lies. Storytelling is nothing more than entertaining lies. It's not real, Fortune. That's your problem. You need to start focusing on the real world. Your world. He said callously. What if they weren't fictional? And they were real people, real flesh, real lives. How could you justify that? It's not fair to them, I shouted. He looked at me, as if I had just spoken an entirely different language. Are you trying to tell me these are living people? That all this time you've been authoring the lives of real human beings and not just fictional characters? I froze, unable to speak or move. Jervis began to laugh, really relieving my tension. <laughs> that would be just ridiculous, right? He spoke with a devious look. What would have happened if I had just spoken the truth then? Would it have saved myself months of misery? My time of confessions would not come until much later. Jervis went to pull out a cigarette from his shirt pocket. Look, kid, let's put all this behind us. Start fresh, even. You want to get back on top? I'll get you there. I can take you even further than you could on your own. Pulling up a chair, he sat down and folded his arms. Jervis had a heavy smoking habit, but whether the cigarette was lit or not, the moment you saw him put one into his mouth, it always meant the same thing. He was about to make an offer. For a moment, I thought of completely dismissing everything he tried to throw at me, but I felt hopeless. Jervis reached out his hand and looked at me with a menacing grin. So how about it, Fortune? Let's make things interesting again. He reached his hand toward me. I looked up at Jervis, the gaping nostrils of his flat, wide nose flared eagerly absorbing the air around us and just as quickly released it back. His eyelids were drooped easily over his pupils. His expression was literally terrifying. I had never seen him look this way. My eyes were caught in his. The longer I looked, the more this commanding feeling started to take over. It was fear. If the eyes were windows to the soul, then these windows had been painted black and no soul was home. I snapped out of it and ran my fingers through my hair. This gave me time to regain my composure. When a deal had to be made, never show signs of weakness. I placed my pen into my mouth, gently turning it as it ran across my teeth. I had my answer. I reached toward him, firmly grasping his hand. Fine. But I have a few suggestions of my own, I insisted. At the time, my current story consisted of six walkers, creations of living organisms. Three couples, to be exact. The young love, Brad and Julie. The troubled love, Michelle and Curtis, and of course, the resilient love, Stephanie and Trent. I, the very person who gave birth to their existence, was about to destroy their lives one by one, just as I would my own. All right, so that's the end of chapter one. If you enjoyed this, let us know if you want more. And if you want to buy the books and maybe read along, there will be links provided for you.